Good morning, church. This morning, our passage is from Psalm 121, and we just heard the choir sing it as well. If you're using the Pew Bible, it will be on page 516, 516. Let's hear the word of God. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in. From this time forth and forevermore. This is the word of God. Good morning, church family. We are in a five-week series in the book of Psalms. We're looking at Psalms of Encouragement and Psalms of Hope. Psalm 121 is a song of a psalm of encouragement and hope, isn't it? Today's message is trusting in the Lord in the journey of life, trusting the Lord in the journey of life. Have you ever embarked on a journey? A journey. It could have been a small thing or a big thing. Maybe it was a a day trip. Maybe it was a hike in the woods. Maybe it was a vacation. A road trip that you spend a lot of time planning and preparing for. Maybe it was a new chapter in life that involved a move and a brand new start or a new job. Journeys can be fun and exciting, can't they? Full of anticipation, full of opportunity. But journeys can also be exhausting and frustrating. When you encounter twists and turns, setbacks that you did not anticipate, A few years ago, my family had the amazing opportunity to visit some of our dear friends in Hawaii. And we crammed into their home to make it work, and we were excited to be able to see the beautiful island of Hawaii. And and if you've heard, you know, beautiful beaches in Hawaii, that's what I heard, and I saw them. But I had no idea how stunning the mountains of Hawaii would be. One day, my good friend and I decided we would each take one of our daughters and we would go on a hike. And so we went to what is a a typical hike, a very touristy hike. Well, it was closed. It was full. And so we kind of were scrambling. That was our plan for the day. And we were looking online. We found close by there was another mountain that was just as high, but a lot harder, a lot more difficult. And we were looking at reviews and they said, do not take kids. This is an advanced hike. And so we held it up and we decided we would take our kids. We talked to our daughters. They said they were up for it. This particular mountain did not have a path that went all the way meandering up like the other mountain we were going to do. It had 1,048 steps straight up the side of the mountain. An elevation, reaching elevation of almost 1,000 feet. And you could see how daunting it was. But it looked exciting, and you, you could tell the view from the top was probably going to be spectacular. And so we, we started on our track, and look, the very beginning of a mountain is actually pretty smooth. It's kind of easy, and it's nice, and you got a lot of energy, and you're, you're just walking, and it's paved, and you're, oh, it's sunny, it's a beautiful day. We're in Hawaii, what could go wrong? We were advised on all the advisors online that said, take breaks every 100 steps. Well, we started going and feeling good. So we kept going. Well, these steps were not steps, we found out. 
They weren't like, oh, you just walk up steps. No, these were old railroad ties from the World War II era. They were very wide in between them, very old, and very broken. And so we found ourselves taking giant steps to get to the next one, and we found ourselves often missing steps, and some of them, some of the part of the, the path was actually uh, over a large ditch that you had to kind of walk across, and if you fell, you'd fall in a long ditch. And so this was a very difficult and dangerous journey. Needless to say, our enthusiasm and excitement waned pretty quickly. It was over, it felt like over 100 degrees, we were drenched in sweat, our legs were throbbing, we actually ran out of water before the most treacherous section, which was the last 200 steps. There were several times we, each of us wanted to quit. In fact, many of the things online said, most people don't make it up and that's okay, just turn around, look at the view and walk back down. We got, we slipped, we got cuts and bruises. We started to get frustrated by the conditions of the trail. How dare they not make this better for us to walk up this mountain? But we kept looking up at the prize. We kept looking up at the goal. Can we make it? Can we make it? The last hundred steps, it was like every 10 steps, we actually took a break. Well, we made it. We were playing Christian songs. We were encouraging one another. You can do it. My daughter was like, Dad, you can do it. I'm like, are you sure you don't want to go back? I, I can understand if you want to go back, man. No, Dad, let's go. We got to the height. We got to the summit. 1,048 steps, and we looked out on the water on the one side, turned around, looked at the, at the valley below. It was, it was unbelievable. I was going to show you pictures, but it doesn't do it justice. You have to go. <laughs> If you can. The Bible often describes the Christian life as a pilgrim journey. We are people who spend our lives on the move. Do you, do you understand that? I mean, God invited Abraham on a journey, didn't he? To a promised land. And it was a difficult and dangerous journey, but it was a journey of faith, and so he went. God invited David on a journey from being this obscure shepherd, uh, the youngest of this family, and he'd go through this dangerous and difficult journey. His life will be on the line many times, but he promised him, David, one day you will be king of Israel. I can keep going. Jesus invited Peter on a journey. You're a fisherman? No, now you're going to be a fisher of men. Paul on a journey from Saul to Paul, Timothy, and the Lord invites you and I on this journey to follow him. And when we start to follow Jesus, everything seems to be almost too good to be true. I remember when I, was a first, when I became a Christian as a child, I was thinking, what, you're telling me I can be forgiven of my sin? Like all of them? The Holy Spirit lives in me and is shaping me into the image of Jesus. I have a purpose for living. Wow, this is amazing. I was just at the bottom of the mountain, you know. Everything looked amazing at that point. But then the steps come. And they're not clean. And they're not easy. And then you begin to slip. Trouble comes. And you start asking the question, what do we do? Where do we turn for help? Psalm 121 gives us a vision of what, what it looks like to trust the Lord as our helper and our keeper or our protector as we journey through life. Let's look at what God's Word says. Lesson number one from this psalm, one of two. Trust the Lord to be your helper. Notice even before you get to verse 1, it says in the heading there, a song of ascents. You see, Psalm 121 is the second of 15 psalms. Psalm 120 to 134 were actually songs that were written for Jewish pilgrims to sing as they were journeying up to Jerusalem for the God-appointed festivals each year. And I said they went up to Jerusalem because the city of Jerusalem was one of the highest points in the land of Israel. And so they would literally sing these psalms, sing these songs as they ascended up the mountains into Jerusalem. 
And as they made this journey, the Jews would see some some spectacular views of the mountains. And it would be absolutely stunning. Have you ever driven across mountains or through mountains, Skyline Drive? Ever hiked up a mountain and checked out the view from up top? To me, it's one of the most breathtaking scenes in all of creation. And I bet that's exactly what the Jewish people felt as they were making their trek up to Jerusalem. The beauty, the splendor of it all, the anticipation of getting to Jerusalem. But they also saw something else. You see, during this time in Israel's history, the entire region of Palestine was overrun with idol worship from the Canaanite people. And the majority of this idol worship was actually done on mountaintops, on hilltops. In fact, the Old Testament has many examples of the Israelites turning away from God and seeking after idols on these, what they call, high places. Remember, David tears down the high places. And it would be on these mountaintops, these hilltops, that they would build shrines and temples to pagan worship. And the lore was, if you wanted a, a, let's say, a bountiful harvest, just go to the shrine of the agriculture god. If you wanted protection from evil and security, and security from danger, go to the sun god. And if you wanted to defeat your enemies, then you go to the, the shrine of Baal. And so you pick your God, you go to that shrine, you make sacrifices, and the Jews would be on this journey, and as they looked up into the hills, they would see these hilltops, these shrines, and they were tempted to veer off course from their journey. They were tempted to take their eyes off their destination and find their help, their support from these hilltop idol gods. Listen, it was very tempting. It was very easy. Why? Because they're right there. You don't have to make the trip all the way to Jerusalem. Just stop here. And you can just go right on home. Just stop here. You can, they offered quick fixes, remedies, protections, appealing solutions. And that's why the psalmist declares, that's why they would sing together on this journey. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. And they would ask the question, from where does my help come? Does my help, does our help come from the mountains, the hills? And their answer had to be no, not a chance. Can you see how right off the bat we are confronted in this psalm with a sobering reality in this journey of our lives? No matter how young or old you are, no matter how many degrees you have, no matter how many gifts and abilities, no matter your income or your retirement account, here's the reality of life. You need help. That's what the psalmist is saying. That's what the Jewish people were confessing. We need help. Why? Because the journey is hard and the burdens are heavy and the dangers are numerous and quite frankly, your strength is limited. You need help. Are you willing to admit that today? Yes, God has gifted you with wonderful talents and abilities. Yes, you have incredible opportunities of living in in a great nation like this. But can you admit that this journey of life is too hard for you to navigate on your own? Can you admit today you are not strong enough, you are not wise enough, and you're quite frankly not sovereign enough to handle all the challenges on your own? People back in the day who would embark on a dangerous and difficult journey, they, were, they, were, they knew enough to know, if I'm going to go on a journey, there's no way I can make it alone. They needed help. And where does our help come from? There's only one answer. Verse 2, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. You see, the answer is not a better job or a nicer house. The answer is not found in a stronger economy, or a relationship, or in sexual freedom. Your source of help should be the only person who himself does not need a source of help. You see? 
Only God qualifies. The word help here is, a, is an incredibly important word. It means relief, assistance, support. But listen, listen to me. Not in the sense that you need someone to assist you as you lead the way. You're not the leader of this caravan and God holds your bags. That's not how this works. That's not what this word means. Understand that. When this word is used with, to connect to God and applying it to God, which is used over 20 times, God is our help, God is our helper, it's always used with God's saving power, his delivering power, his might to rescue. We need God as our helper because we need God to rescue us. God is our helper by doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Notice how personal this is. My help comes from the Lord. This isn't just faith in God's general rule over creation. This is faith in a personal God who can help you, who can help me every step of the way. How can you know the Lord will help you? How can you know that this will be true for you if you are following after God through His Son Jesus? How do you know the psalmist gives us two reasons in verse 2. First, he tells us that the Lord is the one who made heaven and earth. He's saying, look, as you journey up to Jerusalem, as you journey through life and, and you're going through the ups and downs, sure, look around, look at the mountains. Be in awe of them. Consider the raw power it takes to literally make mountains. Anyone ever done that recently? Ever whipped up some mountains? So just consider the raw power it takes to make mountains and then, and then expand that, multiply that by, a, a, I don't know, maybe a bazillion, not a word, and you start to get, get the staggering sense of the power of the one who made heaven and earth. Look, the one who makes a thing is greater than the thing, right? Right? In other words, the God who made something as grand as the Sombrero Galaxy, which is 29 million light years away, and we've only just discovered it year, in, in recent years, the God who made that and the same God who made the, the, the robin or, or the indigo bunting in your backyard is the same God who can help you in your daily struggles. He is the God of unlimited power. And the psalmist is, is reminding us, why would we look to anything or anyone else for help? The second reason you can know God will help you is because He is the Lord. Look in your Bibles at verse 2 again. The Lord, in all capital letters, Lord. This signifies the, the Hebrew name for the, the covenant name of God. Yahweh. King James would say, Jehovah. He is the, the God who revealed himself to Moses. Moses, when he said, Moses said, who shall I say send me when I go to the Israelites to, to take him out of Egypt? Who shall I say send me? And God says, I'll tell you my name. I am. That's my name. Yahweh. He is the God who unilaterally binds himself to his people and offers unwavering commitment to lead and protect us. unilaterally binding himself to us, connecting himself to us, and says, I will unconditionally be your God, no matter how much you mess up, no matter where you stray, no matter what blunder you find yourself in, I am your God, and you can't change it because you didn't do anything to earn it in the first place. That's called grace. Our God has bound himself up in us by sheer love and sheer grace, and that's why nothing can separate us from him through his love. Trust the Lord to be your helper. Secondly, the psalmist tells us, trust the Lord to protect your life now and forever. Verses 3 through 8 is the second section of this psalm, and, and the psalmist switches from God as our helper to God as our keeper. 
fact, the word keep or keeper is used six times in these verses. It has the idea of God being our guardian, our protector. For some of you think guardian of, guardians of the galaxy, right? They, they, they protect the galaxy from all evil, right? They're guardians. They watch over, they protect. God's saying, I am the first and the truest guardian of the galaxy. Make a movie about me. Keeper. We don't use that word, but in some places we do. My son plays soccer, and he plays a position in soccer that's called goal keeper. Why? Because he protects the goal. That's his, that's his mission. That is his one position's goal is to prevent goals, right? To protect. Watch over that goal area. This word is so important Biblically, Genesis, when God creates Adam and Eve and puts them in the garden, he says, what, did, what should you do in the garden? Work and keep it. There's the word keep. Protect it. Watch over it. The, the priestly blessing that, that, that Aaron is supposed to give, God says you are to say in number six, the Lord bless you and keep you. There it is again. May he watch over you. May he protect you. The psalmist is celebrating God's vigilant care over his people. And as the Jewish pilgrims would make their way up through the mountains to Jerusalem, remember, there were no, no paved roads. They weren't deciding whether they take the back road, do I take 301 or 95? Which one's better today? No. You got one road, rocky and rockier. Dangerous and more dangerous, slippery, very easy to stumble and fall. But as God's people, he's saying we, we enjoy a special benefit in our journey through life. He will give us stability for the journey. This doesn't mean a believer will never, this doesn't mean a believer never stumbles and falls, right? He will not let your foot be moved, verse 3. I mean, I'll never fall, I'll never stumble, no. It does mean that whatever temptation or trial leads you to feeling unstable, maybe even, land, maybe even something in life that lands you flat on your back, none of those things will cause you to slip off course. Do you understand? None of those things will lead you to a point where you're so lost that you do not know how to get to where you're going. You're so lost that the one leading you, God himself, can be like, where did he go? I lost her. Where did it? No, It'll, you'll never be in a situation like that. God will keep you on your journey all the way home. And you may have bumps and bruises along the way, but if you're a child of God, he guarantees to lead you every step of the way. That's why at the end of Jude, he says, now to him who is able to keep you from what? Stumbling. Not physically. Not, he knows we're going to stumble. He knows we're going we're gonna to fall. We're, he knows we're going to make errors spiritually. We're going to fail in our relationships at times. We're going to have things in our hearts that go astray. But the God who has rescued you from sin and death, the God who has promised to be your covenant God, he promises he will keep you from stumbling and present you one day in his glory with great joy. That's what he's promising. How is God able to do this? Well, he's your guard, your guardian. If you think about the primary task of a guard, whether security guard, bodyguard, the primary task is protect. Protect. In order to protect, that guard must stay awake. In ancient Israel, the king would have guards who would protect the palace and even the king himself. And if those guards fell asleep, the palace could be invaded without any warning. The king could be killed and literally the city would fall. So sleeping on the job for a guard is a matter of life and death. Not only that, the people groups surrounding Israel worship pagan gods. 
And they believed that these gods were often sleeping and that the people needed to wake them up. Remember Elijah and the prophets of Baal? And he said, I'll let you go first. You make the sacrifice. You sacrifice the Baal. I'll sacrifice to the Lord God, Yahweh, and we'll see who's the real God. And they were crying out to Baal and he wasn't doing anything. And Elijah literally says to them, maybe you need to cry out louder because he might be asleep. He might be doing something else and he can't hear you. He's distracted. That's what they believe. The psalmist here is declaring that the one true God is unlike any of those pagan gods. He never needs to sleep and he never sleeps. He never needs a vacation. Do you need a vacation? Yep, I do. He, does, he never looks forward to the weekend. <laughs> he never falls asleep on the job. Like, oh, what, what happened? Woo! Boss looking? Nope, I'm good. No, he's not counting down the, the minutes until the end of the shift so he can be done. He is always on guard, always alert, always ready to protect. Look, how many of us stay awake worrying at night? about things. If we're honest, many of us struggle with this, me included. Look, when you spend your time worrying at night about things that are beyond your control, you know what you're implicitly saying? You're saying, God, I don't think you're on the job. I don't think you're doing your job. And I think I can do a better job by being my own keeper. Do you really think, listen, do you really think God needs your help to do his job? Do you even know the first thing about doing his job? God is already working the night shift. He doesn't need you doing that. He is sovereignly navigating people and circumstances even while you are sleeping. And so if you show up to relieve him of his duty, he'll simply say, sorry, there's nothing here for you to do. Go back to bed. John Piper famously said, sleep is a daily reminder from God that we are not God. We spend a third of our lives laid on our backs, good for nothing. And God says, do you understand? Do you understand? Verse 5, the psalmist shifts from focusing from God as our keeper collectively to God as your keeper personally. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. In the ancient Near East, the sun was one of the greatest threats to your life. Temperatures can soar past 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And the only defense that a weary traveler would have is to find shade to cover them and protect them. And the psalmist says, this is what God is for us. The word shade signifies the Lord's constant and complete protection. To be the shade on your right hand means his protection is promised no matter what you put your hand to, no matter what circumstance, no matter what you're doing, no matter how you spend your day, the Lord is your shade. He's your protector, constant protector, faithful protector, and he says, day and night, moon by night, sun by day, it's all the time. Around the clock protection, better than ADT. Do we believe that? Are you living in the assurance of God's unfailing, watchful care of every detail of your life? The climax of this psalm is actually verse 7 and 8 where he offers this sweeping promise. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. The Lord will keep you, protect you, guard you from all evil. What does that mean? The second part of verse 7 clarifies. It says, he will, you, he will keep your life. 
The word evil here means any kind of calamity or disaster. And so it begs the question, does this mean that if we follow Jesus, we will never experience evil? Is he saying that once you decide to commit your life, to entrust your life to your creator, your redeemer, that there will be no more difficult days, no more arguments, no more accidents, no more misunderstandings, no more anger, no more loneliness, and no more doubts? I tell you what, there are people peddling that and, 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 and people are flocking to them because they want that. If I could sell you no more of those things and I could prove it from this, but I can't and I won't because this book never says that. The song, in fact, why is he even looking for help? Because he knows their dangers. He knows it's going to be a difficult, tra- a difficult journey. The psalmist is not promising God will protect us from trials, but that he will lead us through trials. You see, when you face difficult trials, crises, circumstances, God's presence and protection will be with you through it all. When you do experience evil, God will strengthen, encourage, uphold you to continue going up the mountain. The Lord will keep you from all evil. I think the best I can say what this means is, He will protect you from being consumed or crushed by evil. He will protect you from being consumed or or crushed by evil, whether it's your own evil internally or evil outside of you. If you are a follower of Christ, if you belong to him, he will protect you from all evil. David affirms the same exact principle in Psalm 23 when he says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. God is not promising health, wealth, and success. How do I know? Because your health is not your life. Your marriage is not your life. Your kids are not your life. Your job is not your life. Your your 401k is not your life. Your retirement dreams are not your life. He doesn't promise to protect those things. He says he will keep your life. If you see any one of those things as your life, then sure, any one of those things goes wrong. You're like, God, what's up with that? I thought I was following you. And you go, oh yeah, finish the sentence. I thought I was following you what? Oh. It wasn't for him after all. It might have been for you. He will keep your life. It literally reads in the Hebrew, he will keep or preserve your soul. None of the trials you are facing, none of the troubles you are enduring has the power to get between you and God. None of them has the power to dilute the grace that he has for you. None of them can thwart God's plan for your life. Do you believe this? You must or you will not. You will decide it's not worth it. I can't keep going. But look, if if you are his, he will carry you all the way up. Come on. We tend to think that our greatest dangers in life are the trials of living in a broken world. Like failed marriages. The cancer diagnosis. The financial crisis, the wayward child, you fill in the blank. That's not your greatest danger, Christian. Your greatest danger is to conclude that when that trial comes, that God is bored watching over you. That he got bored and decided he's going to pay more attention to some other godlier Christian. 
The danger is to believe the lie that God must be too busy dealing with the suffering of the people on the other side of the world and he doesn't have time to deal with my mediocre problems. The threat to your soul, the thing that could take you off the path, to veer you off the path, is to believe that God's love for you goes up or down depending on your level of obedience. No. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will guard your soul. Preserve your life. Protect your life. Well, how long? Is the clock ticking? Until he gets bored? Until, he, until, I, until I finally learn my lesson? Verse 8. The psalmist just sweeping makes it just... The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth, this very moment, and, and forevermore. The going out and coming in, that's a Hebrew idiom, meaning all your daily affairs of life. Everything, whatever you're doing. You get up in the morning, he's watching over your life. You're eating breakfast, he's watching over your life. You get a flat tire, he's watching over your life. You have an argument with your boss, he's watching over your life. Your kids are going crazy, he's watching over your life. Your dinner got burned, he's watching over your life. You're watching Netflix, he's watching over your life. I don't know, I'll keep going. If you are a Christian, whatever you're going through, whatever today brings, whatever tomorrow holds, he is watching over you. That's good news, isn't it? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? This is Paul's way of doing what I just did. What are you going to come up with? Name your thing. And then he doesn't sugarcoat it as it's written. For your sake we are being killed all the day long, we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Ha, huh, no. That's not our true identity. That's not our deepest identity. The Christian life is not just a, a, a conglomeration of all of your trials and struggles, and this is what my life is like. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. He will never stop watching over you until you make it home to glory. That's the forevermore. We really are leaning on the everlasting arms, aren't we? One day your journey here will come to a close. One day your life will be over. Do you have peace about that day? And if you're wondering, why do, we, why do we talk and preach and sing about, about death at church? Here, here's what I would say. Because where else in your life are you confronted with your mortality? You think you're, the, the best show on Netflix is going to confront you with your mortality? You think the ads you're watching are going to confront you with your mortality? No. It's the opposite. Where else... Also, can you find an unshakable hope of the gospel that there is life even after death? No, our calling as pastors is to help you number your days so that you may gain a heart of wisdom and to equip you with the gospel assurance for whenever that day comes. Because when it does, guess what? Even then, God will keep you. His grace to keep you doesn't run out at the end of your life. He will be guarding your soul, watching over your life from this time forth and forevermore. Maybe you're wondering, how can we be so sure? How can I be? How can the psalmist be so sure that God will always be there now to the moment I die and for the rest of life after that? How can we be so confident that he will guide us through every leg of this journey? Let me tell you how we can have such confidence. Let me tell you how you can have such confidence. The psalmist begins by saying, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come? Well, thousands of years later, Jesus, hundreds of years later, Jesus himself would take a journey up to one of these very mountains. You know that? The hills surrounding Jerusalem. 
That's what this psalmist was talking about. Jesus himself would be finishing his own journey as he walks up that mountain with a cross on his back and then he would be hoisted up on the mountain and crucified. As Christians, we lift up our eyes to the hill, don't we? The ultimate hill. We know that our help comes from the Lord Jesus Christ, the maker of heaven and earth. He was the one who fully embodied the trait of helper. Jesus was God's chosen one who who could deliver us from sin and rescue us from, from death. And we know that he lived a perfect life. He was God in the flesh. He performed miracles. He spoke with great authority. He he said, I can forgive sin. I raise the dead. I grant eternal life. And when he came to the end of his life, when his disciples were weary at the news that he would leave them, they fall asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane. And yet Jesus is praying and, and, and agonizing and crying out to the Father. Why? Because he who keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. And then on the cross, Jesus is on full display, dying the death we should have died. He's not dying for his own sin. He had none. He's there because of your sin and mine. He's there because there's evil in our hearts. And you say, why can't God just wink at sin? Why can't he just say, oh, it's okay? No, he's a just God and he will punish all evil. And if we would be judged for our own evil, we would be doomed. We deserve hell, eternal separation from God. And I want you to understand why Jesus had to die. You see, the only way for the Lord, verse 7, to keep you from all evil is to lay all evil on Jesus Christ himself. The only way for the Lord to protect your life was for Jesus to lose his life. And that's what he did. And he died for us in our place, bearing all of our guilt and all of our shame. Oh, but the good news of the gospel is that Jesus didn't stay dead. The grave could not hold him. Christianity is the only faith that claims to worship a God who rose from the dead. And we worship a risen Savior, a one who could not only take away sin and defeat sin, but one who could promise life, eternal life, from this time forth and forevermore. Don't you see, no matter what you have to face in this journey of life, all the twists, all the disappointments, all the wounds, all the battles with sin, your divine protector and keeper has promised to walk with you every step of the way and lead you all the way home. Do you believe that? Do you need right now whether you're watching online or here listening, do you need right now to see, you know what? I've not looked to God for my help. I've not looked to Jesus. I've been looking internally or something in this world. Right now, I need to stop, repent, turn, and receive Jesus by faith as my Savior. Christian, keep trusting the Lord. He's led you this far in the journey, and he will lead you all the way home. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We need you. Jesus, you have been kind and gracious. I pray that today you would gently lead us to take another step of faith, to to move one more step in the journey. Maybe the next step feels really hard. Maybe the previous step really beat us up. God, whatever burden, whatever struggle, whatever trial each one came in with, I pray that they would see that your grace is sufficient, that your power is made perfect in weakness. For the one who who needs to stop and say, Jesus, I invite you to be my Savior. I trust in the finished work of Christ. God, give them the gift to believe. For our church family, Lord, you are the keeper of Israel. You are the keeper of Grace Baptist Church. Would you keep protecting, keep guarding, keep equipping us for the journey? Remind us of the glory yet to come. Remind us not just from this time forth, but remind us there is a forevermore. That our future glory will impact today's trials and give us strength, real strength. 
I pray in Jesus' name, amen.